like I do at County Hall, and uh, I sometimes say things about them. The only one I propose to say anything about today is obviously the uh, helicopter crash at the King Pass Stadium, where although the fire people weren't the first on the scene because the police uh, were there, it was a pretty uh, harrowing, uh, uh, harrowing incident, and I think we should record our thanks formally to the fire crews that attended for the for the work work they did the work they did there. Uh, as you know, the uh, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge attended subsequently, and they met some reliably informed people who were uh, first responders, who were there, in particular the police, who had the most harrowing job, and then obviously some of the fire guys and women who were there. So if we can just, uh, as I say, um, acknowledge the work that Rick and Rick's team Rick's team did. Uh, if you want to ask anything on the inspection, you can do. I've been there twice. I was there for the first day to meet Zoe Billingham, who's the head inspector. And then I went back for another couple of hours to meet the lady whose name is Rick. It's Davinda Johal. Davinda Johal, who's the woman who's doing all the work, really. And I had a couple of hours with her. Uh, Hinkley Road incident, Rick's done well. He's got us some money back. Uh, Treasurer, I have to say. Uh, tre Treasurer, thank Alison. Well done, Alison. Uh, CFA conference, uh, Dan attended it, and I'm reliably informed that next time we have one, Sue Barton wants to attend, and if Sue contacts uh, Rick, we'll provide the same arrangements for Sue to attend in instead of uh, Dan. Uh, five, yes, uh, shall I just finish? I'll tell you what, I'll just finish, because I've got nothing else. So firefighter Bob Miller, you can see, blood doing a service, long service awards. Again, I attended that. It was well attended. I was there with the Lo Deputy Lord Lieutenant of Leicestershire and the Lord Lieutenant of um, Rutland. And then the carol service uh, was yesterday and James Poland went. So I'll take questions and you're number one, Betty. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, can I say in terms of the conference, in the past, we used to have members from each of the groups attend the conference, and I don't know, that seemed to have go back, gone by the wayside. So I wonder if we could have a discussion whether or not uh, members of the main bodies could attend the conference. My second one, my second question really is, it's not a question, it's a comment really. In the report, I feel that we have too many notings rather than decision-making. We are a decision-making body. So I wonder if in the, fu in the future we could look at how we're asked to do things, whether we approve recommendations or what. But there's too many notes. Please note. That's just an observation for me. Thank you. On the conference, Betty, I'm pretty relaxed. If, uh, if anybody who wants to go can go. I mean, it's uh, pretty onerous. I, I, I personally don't want to go, but uh, Dan's gone because he's asked to go. And if any of you guys want to go or any of the Liberal guys want to go, you just uh, get in touch with Rick, I think. To do that, it would be useful if the information about the conference is circulated to the group, to the group leaders, I think. Sure, we'll undertake okay. to do that. Will it be Rick or will it be, will it be you, Rick, or will it be the Secretariat? It will be me. Okay, Rick will nominate the subject to the group leaders. Are you the group leader for the Liberals, then, or is it? <laughs> Okay, well, one, well, we'll make sure one of you guys gets it, and if you want to go, you can go. Uh, on the noting, I agree with you entirely, and today we have some firmer recommendations which have eliminated quite a bit of noting. Okay, so shall we? I've got no other questions on my report. No, good, so we'll move on. Uh, so, Chair's announcement's done. Uh, no uh, questions under public participation. So the next thing, next thing is the minutes from the 22nd, 27th of September, taken as read, confirmed and signed. I'll move them. Second, Chair. Kirk seconding them. All in favour? Thank you. Uh, minutes of corporate governance. Uh, the chairman's away. I understand you're the deputy chairman, Betty. Yeah. Vice chairman. Yeah. You can. So they've been moved by Betty, seconded by Dan. We'll take questions from you, Bill. <laughs> I notice on page 16 of the report, um, item 37, financial monitoring, there's a question about uh, East Midlands Ambulance Service. Yes. Um, question is quite basic. Has any rent been paid? 
Uh, has the contract been signed? And if not, why not? Because later on, on page 100, we've got the contract procedure rules. Well, what happened here? Um, we let something without a contract, which I think is against financial regs, um, which perhaps Lauren might like to answer. But the other hand is that um, if the building's been occupied by another body, um, the fire service has been paying all the expenses and no, no recouping from the other body. So it doesn't, as an outsider reading all these minutes, it doesn't seem right to me that... Um, this has been allowed to continue. Have we got an update at all, please? Indeed, Bill. As an insider, it's not very good. Uh, you can have a go at it, Lauren. Well, I'm simply to say that um, I'm afraid I don't know the history of um, how the occupation came to um, arise without the formalities having been entered into. Um, but I know that colleagues in um, my service are working with colleagues in the fire authority uh, to regularise the position. And in relation to the sums that are owing, um, I don't think there's any issue in relation to the um, amount of money that will be transferred um, in, in terms of the retrospective rent and so on. I don't think that's, that's the problem. But you're right in relation to the governance issues. It would have been, uh, you know, it's not appropriate for that sort of arrangement to be entered into. Um, without uh, the proper formalities having been completed. I, I was wondering, I, I mean, I agree with Bill. They, they've, they've been there too damn long, not signing up. Can we play hardball with them, Rick? Could we say to them, six months, you either sign or you're out? Would that be help? I'm not sure who I'm asking this, but I'm fed up with them. They're, they, they let us down over Castle Donington badly, and they're letting us down badly here. We know they're a very bad organisation to deal with, but I'd like to uh, bring some fire to bear on them. Well, excuse all the puns, but we're all fired out. We try and put them out, not create them. But no, in, in all seriousness, the decision to move um, partners into the service buildings was taken many years ago during some of the construction phases of those buildings, and the, 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 the um, CFA were aware uh, of the EMAS move into our headquarters and it was unfortunate that the changes in EMAS have meant that there's been several changes in their senior leadership team which has meant we've not been able to get the final agreement and of course every time there is a change in terms of legal positions they want some different clarity on wording which has just dragged the whole issue out and I'm, I'm with the, you chairman it's deeply frustrating I'm, I'm more than happy to try and be clear with EMAS over the CFA's position that if they do not get this sorted within six months, as you outline, I'm more than happy to, um, to to look to legal to look at what other options we have next, if that's the agreement with the board. Do you want to move that, Bill, that if they've got six months to sign and or they're out, and I'll second it, because I'm fed up with them. So but will you formally move it, and we can vote on that, and we can do some more questions. Six months. I think we're all fed up with them. They can't stay there and not sign the lease. You, you wouldn't allow it if you were renting out your granny's house. So we shouldn't allow it when we're renting out a large part of the fire authority building. So moved by Bill, seconded by me. All in favour? Rick, that's unanimous, so you can tell them. By June, they're out. And just to deal with the last issue, be absolutely assured, we have had our fingers burnt here in relationships to try and work on goodwill. Um, and unfortunately, when you have these experiences, our goodwill has been eroded, so we will be doing everything legally compliant, which we shouldn't have to do, I should say, with partners who are reputable in the way that um, EMAS are. Yeah, they're, they're awful to deal with, honestly. They really are bad. There's something no one in charge and no political accountability. They're bloody awful. Uh, Shall we move on then? So we've done, it was moved and seconded by Betty, the minutes. Are we all happy to approve the minutes? Okay, good. Right, so if we move on to the eight, which is uh, in the IRMP, as we call it, 21 to 24, uh, Rick's going to present it. Uh, obviously, it's a key strategic plan for us. It sets our direction for five years. In the past, it causes some minor political grief, didn't it, uh, Kirk? And we don't want it to cause us political <coughs> grief in the future. So we have some new recommendations, which I think everybody should have which we're going to be moving to once Rick has presented the report. Over to you, Rick. Thank you, members. Um, the paper 
um, obviously, unfortunately, light on detail, um, picking up on the points made by Councillor Newton and the Chairman. Um, we'll certainly make those more robust as we move forward. Um, we're to give you the milestones of the timeline that we're looking to get this uh, IRMP in. So those were four key milestones. Um, in terms of the, recommend the new recommendations, what we will do is stage one will be the involvement of CFA in the scoping and the arrangements that will be looked at prior to engagement with the public through consultation. And of course, the, what we've already agreed and was agreed at the last meeting, that an additional um, diary date in January 2020, which seems an awful long way away, but is already in, in the diary, so that hopefully the proposals from the IRMP will be presented to the fire authority for your final approvement, approval or change, and that will coincide with the February meeting where the RMP will be put to CFA and the budget proposal for that year goes through at the same time. So the two things converge long term. Um, the, the, the issues of the recommendations are, are for me to, to, to make sure don't happen again and to ensure that we get your involvement because item page 22 item 5 and 6 show you what was proposed <coughs> under the last IRMP and actually what was agreed in the f following the final consultation so of course we do expect anything that has changes to be difficult to manage chairman great Questions to Rick from anyone. Are we happy with the new recommendations, which certainly uh, involve us? Because I said we want to avoid any political difficulty if we can. Betty. On page 28, if I may, recommendation five um, is. 28. 28. Page 28. Oh, sorry. Ah, oh, my apologies. I've uh, been skipping along. <laughs> Save your question for later. We will indeed. <laughs> okay, so we've got the new recommendations here, which beef up uh, what Which was in there yeah. before yeah. and certainly involve us guys a lot, lot more than yeah. they did, and it'll come back in February. Exactly. I'll move it. Do you want to send it, Kurt? Are we all happy? Yes, yeah. yes. Great. That's the information. Now we go to number nine, which is the Home Office industrial action business continuity plan very exciting uh, over to you rick again yeah, members will be aware um hopefully it's contained in this paper some clarity over the previous um concerns raised by government over our provisions should industrial action take place we had visits earlier in the year and a draft paper was received from the home office which we were hope would be presented now which for final sign-off unfortunately it sits within the mechanisms of the home office so all we have to work on is the draft we have been in contact with their lead who came to do the inspection and we do not anticipate and say we don't anticipate any changes from the draft proposal because it's going through process so hopefully the recommendations in the paper give you some sense of the things that we will have to consider in making this revision much more robust um, but it's also worth remembering that the CFA at the early part of this year were given the opportunity to discuss the provision of a third party contractor which would give us the assurance of a provision during an industrial action period but the costs were deemed to be prohibitive over the three year contract based on what experience we had in, in the past. Thank you. Well, we've got some recommendations, and being as Betty doesn't like the word notes, I think it is recommended that the CFA recognises the content of the report and agrees the proposed response to the recommendations made by the Home Office as set out in paragraph 4.6 is appropriate. So I think recognises is a lot better word than notes. So are you happy with that, Kirk? So if I move that and Kirk seconds it, are we happy to uh, accept it? Good, okay, thank you. So we're just altering the word note to recognise this. Uh, item 10, impact of proposed control room collaboration between <coughs> NFRS and DFRS, that's Nottingham and Derbyshire. Uh, over to you, Rick. And then we've got some um, changes to the recommendations because it wasn't clear to me from the report why we haven't engaged with Nottingham and Derbyshire or explored options of joining forces with other 
blue light surfaces. Uh, so I think the recommendations, the new ones, will encourage Rick to go away and have another look and have another go and then come back to us. Because some of us are new and haven't been involved with this as much as uh, some people. So do you want to have a go at explaining it, Rick? I'll endeavour to. Um, the, the arrangements with Derbyshire and Notts are a complex one and started back in after the um, national fire control project was shelved by government and we were given local monies and that's outlined in the in the paper. Our arrangements with the with Derbyshire and Notts have been such that since we've gone live with the system, which was in 2015, um, we have been working with the provider to ensure we get full um, delivery of the contracted um, agreement and some of that has proven to be more complex than, than we would like. Um, there was some discussion, I believe, in 2015 and 16 around uh, moving the control rooms in a different direction to what was originally proposed and that seemed to fall by the wayside. Both Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire have decided because of the collaboration they do together that they will merge their two control rooms. The CFAs in Derbyshire agreed this proposal earlier this week and Nottinghamshire are meeting on the 14th to ratify their position. So their merger will take place. The issues that are identified in the paper are about our concerns of how their merger will impact on our current provision and arrangements. And outlined in the paper on page 41 uh, and 42 are some examples, and I say some examples, it does say again on the, the, the paper on the bottom of page 40, these measures include, these aren't the final letter measures, but these were our early um, considerations on what the impact of their merger will have to our fire control provision and what things we may need to consider now, I've taken some advice from legal as to the contract, and the contract is very complex. Lauren may be able to comment as to the contract, but we are in contract with those partners for seven years um, with a value of the contract to be paid should anyone um, want to vary it. And, of course, what you can do um, is change your mind, but, of course, you're contracted throughout the period. So whilst there is some ability to come back and to flex uh, with the recommendations, I'm not sure we will be able to get a broader sense from other parties. I'll go back to the other chiefs to see if there's interest, but we have to get agreement from the three parties before anything can be formally agreed away from the original contract. I'm not sure that does help because it's a complex issue. Sounds a bit like Brexit to me. Uh, <laughs> Lauren, do you want to add anything to the contract? I think it's well worth uh, going away and having a look at it and coming back with a full, a full report. I mean, just because you pull out of something doesn't mean you're automatically going to pay the seven years or whatever's left on the term. There's some negotiation between the maximum and the minimum, and I think it'd be well worth having a look at. Same as if you pull out of a leased car, your contract's for three years, but you'll often get away with only paying half. What you've got to do is go and ask them, but I think uh, we need to have a look at it. Because uh, in here it says... Uh, why we don't propose to join and, and, and identify the risks and also have a look at other services within our area where we may collaborate. So I think uh, go and have a go and bring it back. Take some questions to Rick or to Lauren. It's just when we look at the, the different options on page 41 and I just wanted to, 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 to they say it's going to cost 146000 each year um, is this affordable? Is this good value for money? Is this poor value for money? I've got no sense of uh, really on this one. And also, uh, the buddy system, um, I think a bit more explanation about what that is and uh, will this risk, is there a risk with the buddy system as well? I think a little bit more information would be helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, good question. The, 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 like I say, the options are only options. They're certainly not things we're recommending and asking the authority to, to support. What we're trying to do is outline that there are different ways of achieving the end goal. Um, the reality with what we've got in really simple terms is that currently there are three control rooms all taking 999 calls across the three services with the ability to mobilise fire appliances in each and every one of those three areas. That currently is staffed with 12 people, four in each control room as a minimum. 
What this merger means, as it says in the paper, is that in total for the three services operating out of two control rooms will be six in Derbyshire and four here. Our concern is that should the system fall over, because technology has the occasion that it falls over, that during those arrangements, our four control operators will be unable to manage three control rooms worth of calls. And that's all this is to do, is to try and give you a headline that officers are thinking about that implication. I have, since the paper was drafted, met with Derbyshire and Knotts and been given some assurance as to the business continuity plan in arrangements that they are considering to ensure that the burden doesn't just fall to us, but I'm yet to see them and therefore I couldn't contain them in this report to give you further assurance, but certainly we can follow back up with the clarity once their relative CFAs have then finally agreed the provision, so that will be post Christmas, and of course we'll feed back as to what we think the best option is here. It's certainly not my intention to want to spend unnecessary monies, bearing in mind how tight our fiscal position is, Chairman. Yes, well, the motion brings it all back to us when he's done the full report. So, are we all happy with that? Moved by me, certainly by Kirk. Yes, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. The question, Chair, is when we're going to get the paper? When? Well, certainly before February. When are we going to get it? Well, we'll get the, the we get an update now. As I said to you, I found out verbally um, two days ago that Derbyshire had agreed the provision. I'm yet to see their their minutes. Knotts is on the 14th. Um, of this month, once that's been agreed, and I can obviously make some determination of how that will impact on us. I would hope, uh, if not expect, that if you want it before February, we can give you some provision before February, but February is in your diaries, and that would seem like a, a, a reasonable place. That's Nothing right. is to take place in the two control rooms that I'm yet to believe, because I haven't seen the plan until July of next year. Not we've got a timeline, Chair, that's all that matters. And you're all in favour. Thank you. Agenda item 11 is the estates plan. As we know, after staff, the biggest cost is buildings. We need a strategic review of the services estate and what the buildings would be used for, and it would be best to do that within the IRMP. So uh, there is a now an amended motion, which you should have in front of you, which again brings stuff back to February, uh, and I'll let Rick speak to uh, his paper. Thank you, Chairman. The, again, I think this paper outlines some decisions and background of how we've um, managed to secure the £6 million that we believe we need to invest into our estates. We are not confident that that is the final amount that we need, but of course it would be remiss of me to go and spend money on buildings when the RMP is under review. So it's, it, makes, it seems to make sense in my head that we, all we do here is outline the fact that we have some money. It's been earmarked. We've expressed that earmarking through to government because they have obviously got an eye on local authority reserves. So we've told them where we believe the money is going to be utilised. The RMP process will be the determining factor of at which priorities, and of course that will come to you as earlier discussed in the earlier paper. So this paper really doesn't ask you for a decision at the moment because it, it is only to note that we have £6 million. We believe there is some focus areas which are outlined in the paper, but I can't confirm they will be because they may be adversely influenced by what comes out of the RMP process. So this is just a bit of a heads up. Chair, I'd be happy to, to move this to the, for a report to come back on the 6th of February. Can we have someone from the city? Very good. Okay, moving on. Uh, 12, firefighter recruitment, 55 to 60. Over to you, Rick. Again, I think members, certainly um, CFA members who are at CGC would have seen this report it's slightly amended from them because it's got a paragraph in there around our uh, role around apprenticeships. Um, basically, it outlines that we are short of staff between now and the, the, the timeline that our, our workforce planning team look towards, and we need to bring people on board now. Our overtime budget is um, has been exceeded year on year, and I'm certainly not um, happy about that position. So bringing in a blend of range, blended range of firefighters, um, 
so transferees in, some migration at on-call, as well as the recruitment that we started in October. The recruitment and interview processes are going on while we speak today. Um, the CGC have asked for um, an update as to the outturn in terms of both diversity um, as well as other numbers and other learning that we can make. The concerns that were raised at CGC and other members may want to build on that at our last meeting was that we in the past have made a decision to restrict recruitment from the LLR region and there were some dis discussions as to why we had done that but again that was explained at the last meeting. I'm happy to take any questions. Well, we've got Betty first, and while you're there, when you're speaking, Bertie, see if you can find a, another word rather than noted. So rather than uh, we're noting the firefighter recruitment, if you can dream up a, another word that's more punchy than noted. Perhaps accept. <laughs> Probably a better word, though. I just want to speak to page 57, if I may. You know, this issue is very close to my heart. Um, and I do worry about the fact, and we've talked privately about it, Nick, about underrepresented groups not, not managing to get through. And this is a concern, is it's they're really not representative of the population, especially the population of Leicester City. So we've got the statistics here, all that equalities information, and then we've got down to the short list. And I wonder if we could actually get a breakdown of those who managed to get through the interviews, the interview stage. And also, what else can we do to attract underrepresented groups to come forward? Um, I don't know whether it's a confidence building exercise or what, but I really do feel that uh, um, we, we're overrepresented by white males. <laughs> That's a true statement, and also, we'd, although we're getting more applicants for the jobs that we've got, we're not getting the sheer volume of applicants we used to get because of the erosion of the of the pay. Do you want to have a go at whether or not we c anything else we could legally do? I mean, myself, <laughs> myself, and Peter have always focused on this, and we've pushed the envelope. I think we're pretty much there, aren't we? Well, I'd like to try and assure members that we, across the service, have. And part of the decision making to restrict the numbers to LLR means that obviously the nature of the city with the representation of diversity, the, the, you know, the, the single city in the country where the white population is not the majority, um, would help or it would feel that it would help. Clearly what we're seeing and we've done in the last recruitment in 2016-17, we did 28 have a go days. Um, which proved to be pre pretty successful. Um, we learnt from those and we realised that they did have, um, or there was some of the tests that we were doing does, does have a negative effect on female firefighters or the potential female firefighters and applicants. In this year, what we've learnt from the previous time is that we focused, and instead of having 28 have-a-go days, we had much fewer. We had about, I think it was eight to 10. I can't remember the exact number, so apologies for that. But what we did do is we concentrated on female and BAME um, candidates specifically. And we were criticised for that as well, for making that sort of very targeted approach. We do believe it's the right approach. And of course, the numbers suggest that it doesn't, um, it doesn't make a huge difference. What I assure you is we are working within the envelope of the law. Um, if we could do more, we would do more. Um, I think there's, I, I'd certainly welcome, and my team would certainly welcome any ideas that members may have. I can assure you that I've also spoken to the Chief Constable and to the EMAS lead as to why they do not have the same issues in either attraction into their particular roles. And I can't find a single silver bullet that says a change of legislation or a change in circumstance meant that the jobs became more appealing. Um, we, work, we won't give up on this because it is really important to everyone in the service. And I know, Councillor, you're, you're very much behind that. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to add, I can see that <coughs> the interview is going on now at the moment where we are in the meeting. But we want some kind of action to let other people know in the citywide that this job is available for everybody and uh, they are welcome to take in part in it. So we want to action, you know, just not noted. Yeah, some kind of action for uh, next year. 
Thank you. Um, prior to the campaign opening, we, I think it opened on the 15th of October, but closed on the 23rd of October. Up from the, the time we, we came to CFA last, we were working directly with um, minority groups and um, what I would say would be representatives throughout the city to try to encourage the people who come into their um, community groups to consider a role in the fire service. Now, obviously, the figures don't suggest that that was as successful as we would like, but again, I, I can give you details of where we went, but I don't think it would be appropriate for this paper at this meeting, it's just background. We do do a lot of legwork um, building up to this. It's not a case of just putting an advert out and then hoping that someone will turn up. Thank you. Yeah, to, be, to be fair, we, myself and when Peter was the vice chair, we have made big efforts with this. As I said, we have pushed the envelope as, as much as we can, but if you have particular experience in the city, send it to Rick or particular places where you think we should send someone to tell people these jobs are available. We do need to do better, but we are doing as best we can with the tools that were, illegal, were legally allowed at the moment. But as Betty's pointed out, it's still not good enough, but we recognise it and we are trying and any help from you guys in the city would be well received. So we've got a rec... Oh, yes, so, Ted, sorry, okay. I haven't got you down. Ted. No, apologies. So, I mean, as a matter of comparison then, compared to the other blue light services, how, how does the, the, the ethnic and um, gender mix of the staff and applicants, two separate co categories, um, compare? Do, do, the same pro do, do we think that the other blue light services are, have a more, uh, more of an appeal? A general appeal, or is, uh, you know, uh, are we dealing with perhaps a historic um, view of the fire service that maybe does or does not exist in other blue lights? Um, I think again, a, another good question. It would be um, silly to say there isn't difference across the blue light services because we see certainly gender difference and the, the attraction of being a police officer and a paramedic to be more appealing to female staff um, compared to where we are. As a fire service, we are no, not dissimilar to other fire services. So the fire sector as a whole is generally seen as unappealing. The reasons for that, I can't answer that question. I wish I could. Um, there clearly has to be something to do with legacy, but I know certainly the Fire Brigade Union have a, a very strict and, and um, are very conscious about um, diversity and equality. And, and certainly I'm, I'm meeting with our um, internal diversity lead following the AFSA conference that we attended um, last month to talk about what we can learn from what other services are doing and where they've had some success. Um, but we will certainly engage with our union colleagues as well to try to see what the issues are. But there is no silver bullet. And again, I, I reiterate that if there was, we would certainly grab hold of it. Therefore, Chair, um could, could I move that we, we we state for the minutes because I know we, we say we don't note that that we um, that this matter was discussed and we we heard from the the chief officer and we were we were satisfied that last year fire authority was doing taking uh, sufficient steps um, in its efforts to to do this and I, I think we need to appreciate that the last year fire authority are doing <coughs> All they can. They, they do, you know. From from from. If if someone was in this room now and, and heard what was being said, they would say, "Well, they are trying hard." Could, uh, if members agree, say that the report on fire recruitment be accepted? We note that we are. Well, we don't use note. We are trying hard, but recognise that more needs to be done. We could we could add that. So that recognises the work that. Rick and his team do, but also recognises the point that more work needs to be done. And as Rick says, there is no silver bullet, and we do try. That's why I said to Councillor Thalduka, Thol if he knows anywhere where we can send firemen to tell people. Can we accept those extra words on then? Dan. Thank you, Chairman. 
Um, my thought and concern is that we're spending 30,000 in recruitment drives. We're 10% under what we should be in staff numbers. So I support every previous speaker's comments 100%. But obviously there has to be a concern. Are we getting enough people in to be able to man the service correctly? because the chief's got a problem with his overtime <laughs> sparring out, and obviously if we haven't got the full complement, there lies your problem. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Sue, welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry I was it's late. Okay. I had an interview Better late this than morning. Never. Thank you. <laughs> and apologies to everybody. hope I didn't disturb you. Uh, we, d we do have a problem, obviously, with equalities in recruitment, and some of it I've just heard to the last two contributions. Someone's referred to firemen, and someone man yes. we're undermanned, so we have yes. a language issue as well. But it's a slow process over time. It's not going to happen just... We're not going to get equality just because we, we say that we're going to do it. So it's about changing attitudes in society. I know that we do have some firefighters that go out and, vi and visit schools uh, where you're looking at perhaps a future generation of recruits. Maybe it would be useful if a female firefighter could be one of those that went out as the role model to, to that next generation. It probably does happen, but I don't know. Uh, so that might be one way of, of influencing so that we look so that it doesn't become an unknown for for young women in the future that might be thinking of joining or people perhaps from diverse backgrounds the same could apply or to LGBT backgrounds that that people are seeing those those groups as role models that they could aspire to do as well that it's not just about men I think Rick's actually doing that I mean we, when we, we, I, I personally seen the presentation from the lady who who, who, who was successful. Anyway, Rick, do you want to answer, Sue? Yeah, I think, it, again, it's a really good point, but again, I'd give you some reassurance that we speak to um, our female colleagues and we ask them to, to take the lead. Unfortunately, there are such few numbers. They feel sometimes burdened with a pressure to, to take those roles, and our BME colleagues as well. Um, I think if you look across our service and certainly the recruitment drives that we do, the online videos that we promote, we have a very representative bag of staff. Um, um, that I, 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 I'd like to sit here and say, well, yeah, we, we, we don't do that. I think what's really also important for members to know is that, w that our diversity and inclusion is, uh, is, cha is uh, championed by a councillor, which is really helpful for us. Um, and again, it, we, we learn from the work that we do with um, Councillor Newton to, to move us forward. But we are working in all those areas. But I think it, the focus on individuals, once they're in service, puts an unnecessary pressure on them that a number of them have asked and said, please don't focus on me. I feel really uncomfortable. And we end, end up almost har haranguing them. And that, that feels equally wrong. So we've got some uh, new recommendations which recognise what we've done. And uh, just one thing too, I think when people say firemen, I don't think they're being sexist. I mean, I'm guilty of saying it's just sometimes it trips off the tongue a lot easier than fire and rescue officer. You know, you don't really mean actual man in a uniform, but we do need to perhaps make more effort to say fire and rescue officer rather than fireman, firefighter. But well, they don't just do fires now, we do more res We've cut more people out of cars than we fetch out of fires. Uh, Janet. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on page 56, uh, the service will also look to access firefighter apprenticeships. Could I just have a little bit more information as to <laughs> how you're looking at that, please? Thank you. Yes, um, again, we're, we are the, the levy for, uh, we, you know, we have to contribute because of the size of the employer we are to the um, apprenticeship levy. The firefighter um, apprenticeship scheme was something that was proposed to the CFA right at the beginning when we, we first understood what a firefighter and apprentice might look like. Unfortunately, the standards have taken a long time to come down and we've not seen accreditation and various other things to allow us to focus on firefighter apprentices. So we have previously reported to um, authority that we would use the apprenticeship levy for development of staff, which is included now in leadership and management as an apprenticeship. So I think there's just a recognition that apprentices are probably not like, certainly when I started and left school, which I was a gas board apprentice at age 16. Yes, um, yeah, boo-hoo. Um, 
Uh, so they're not 16 to 18 year olds, they can be of any age. And I think that's equally important. So if we've got any imageries of just young people being apprentices, that's wrong. But we are looking, as this paper says, now that we believe that there is clarity over those standards to look at firefighter apprentices, and that's why that budget amount has been identified to help us move that forward. And as the, the chair and the comments around the table, maybe those will be the future firefighters going forward. We've given that a good airing, and he's got the message. So, so oh, sorry, Jaha. Yeah, just um, one or two points that I'd like to make is um, there's a lot of industries which were very in a similar position to where we find ourselves with recruitment of uh, BAME candidates. Um, but they've made inroads. The, slow, the progress is slow, but they're getting there. And I just feel that we sort of we're still in the start um, in the starting block. Um, what I'd really like to understand is, I know you've done a lot of work. Um, sounds a bit have a go when we sort of can. Is there a strategy uh, around that, maybe a five-year strategy, and have we got the measures and the monitoring processes um, to see that you know in five years this is what we've done, the strategies either worked or it hasn't, because these are what the numbers are proving. That, that's what I'd like to understand. And again, I think that's a really good question. We have a strategic equalities, diversity and inclusion board. Um, so they look at the longer term aspirations of the organisation and a tactical one that deals with the stuff that comes up regularly. One of the things that we have learned from other services is they do sort of recruitment now <coughs> ongoing. So they, they're keeping people focused, even though they may not be taking them on. And then they, what they don't do is they don't go out to the open market. What they do do is say, well, we've been speaking to you about being a firefighter for the last two years. There's a job coming up soon. Do you want to start thinking about application and development? They're things that we're considering monitoring. But again, I'd say to the authority that that does cost money. It does cost time. And of course, up until very recently, we have not recruited regularly other than in our on-call arrangements. And again, in our on-call provision, most of you will be aware that most of our on-call provision is in the rural parts of the county where we are representative in terms of BAME. What we're not representative is in gender. And of course the gender issue is equally as important as the BAME one. So the, the issues between whole time recruitment and on-call recruitment are very different because of course you have to live within five minutes of the fire station for your response times. So of course, if unless you live there, um, then we can't recruit from you. We, we've, we've looked at extending those times, but of course we have response duties and we have um, standards that we try to meet. So I think the point's well made and we, we have got that. And I'd like to think that if the authority wants something, I can speak to Councillor Newton outside this meeting to see if the strategic board could do a presentation um, to the authority or to CGC about where and the direction of travel. Super. Well, we've got some amended recommendations which accept where we are now, but no, note that we need to, we don't use the note, think of some other word, but, but recognise more needs to be done. Are we all happy with that? That's good. Thank you. Okay, so we now move on to the problems with uh, on call. Uh, Rick, that's on pages 61 to 64. <laughs> we'll, we'll find many creative words that don't say note. Um, this paper is only designed to reiterate the issue that we have been facing. We've reported to CGC previously and they are monitoring progress. Um, and this is to give you an overview on the things that we are considering as part of a longer term strategy, not a quick fix. Um, clearly it will mean that we have to negotiate, we will have to work outside what are the traditional negotiating national positions and they can be complex. Um, so whilst we will try our best to push the boundaries, as a, a fire authority we have to work within the institutions that sit above us and, and we do so. But we certainly are active in working with the representative bodies to try to ensure we have adequate fire cover with the right people. I think what we need to do here is, rather than just note, we need to recognise that we have a problem with on-call, and the on-call ones, for us Conservatives, will be the most difficult, because if we can't get staff to run some of these smaller fire stations in the villages, they won't tick your boxes when it comes to, when it comes to the IRMP, will they, Rick? 
Sorry, one of the issues that um, I've discussed with the chairman is the on-call provision um, is a very cost-effective one. Unfortunately, it's so cost-effective that staff who are employed in it can be giving up their time to provide provision for us for as low as, I think I've heard the sum of 37 pence an hour. Um, not something that's very attractive in a position where you have to live and stay within four minutes of a fire station. So we're going to try and change that. But of course, that adds cost to the baseline. But of course, that hopefully increases our availability, which means that we can respond to the most rural parts of the community in our two attendance standards, which are 10 and 20 minutes. Are you, are you happy to beef up the recommendations rather than just note that we, we can see the content of the paper, but we recognise that there is a problem with on-call recruitment? And it, I mean, it wouldn't be uh, wrong to say in the, in the, in the rural areas, because it's not a problem in the city because they're full-timers. It's not a problem in Colville, Loughborough, Market Arbor. It's the really rural areas, isn't it? Well, just to, to be clear, we do have problems. I mean, Hinkley is a, a large urban area, and our performance in Hinkley on our on-call fell to as low as 21% recently. So, of course, the rural locations are the ones where you think are most problematic, but they, they, they are in the urban areas as well, where our whole time establishment is supplemented and then sometimes replaced at Mar Market Harbour, Lutterworth and Melton by on call. So we have cover during the day from full-time firefighters and we have a reliance on our on call staff in the evenings. So it is a mixed bag. It isn't just in the most rural locations. It does affect some of the more urban areas. If we went for the CFA, accept the content of the report and recognise the problems that the CFA, CFA has with on-call recruitment. Would that help, Rick? That gets rid of the word note as well, Betty, so. I mean, there seems to be a problem here, and I just yeah. wonder, would it be possible to maybe have um, a small working group to look at it, would, if it would help the chief, I don't know, bring, bring in some other ideas? Sorry. Apologies if it's not clear. Um, we have got a project group looking at this of internal staff working with a wide range of people. So this is a project. Um, this isn't just being left This is for one person in an office. This is organisationally driven and does take up resourcing. Uh, and obviously you'll report back to here because people are generally interested and genuinely want to help you. Yeah, we can report back to here, but again, be assured that regular reporting on on-call availability goes to CGC at every one of their meetings. It's one of the key performance indicators, um, so that they are monitoring, and, and <coughs> hence why it's here now, because we had such a slippage previously. Super. Bill? Yes, Chair. Uh, when is the report coming back? How successful you've been about the recruitment? I mean, will it be come back in six months or 12 months, or what time scale are we talking about? Okay, the, again, the, the, a really good question. The project initiation document was approved by senior management team and internal staff very recently. It will take time to deliver. I think the actual timeline of the project is one year, but it actually extends. There's a short, medium and long-term provision within that, but I can bring that detail back to this meeting to give you absolute clarity on the dates. But they are mapped out in the time. This is not a quick fix. This is going to take lots of negotiation, lots of engagement, lots of consideration, perhaps some trials and some pilots, some which we hope will be successful, some which will probably fail. Um, we're looking at a long-term strategy for an immediate problem. Okay. Which, man, on, which you should have in, in front of you. Cars and the provision of cars are politically sensible with, a, with big P's, small P's, and any amount of P's when you speak to members of the public. So um, do you want to have a go at um, speaking to the report, Rick, and then we can move the recommendations, which hopefully give some direction. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, again, as the Chairman's outlined, this was an update on the review that took place in 2016 to show you what we said we would do, that we have done. Um, the issues around the, the appliance, so spring to page 66, part three, uh, bullet point three, Whilst the decision to defer the ALP was considered, it says that the decision was revisited on the 25th of December, 27, uh, September 2017, and that was following Grenfell, and, and it was felt that the public would expect the fire authority, if it had reasonable means, to have high-rise capability. Now, we have an ALP. The problem is our, all of our ALPs around the country are very expensive, and many of them are getting old. Our neighbouring authorities have just reduced the provision of high-rise um, in Derbyshire by one and therefore should we have an accident or a damage with our ALP we would be without any provision at all that's why that that was revisited in part three I'm quite happy to defer it yet again um, because clearly it's quite a significant investment but of course it does have implications to our potential and I say potential response capability long term um, that is quite clearly a, a decision for the authority. All the other elements of this within the, the report um, around officers' cars, which are very, very um, problematic in some respects, certainly for, uh, from the chairman's perspective, even from my own officer's pr perspective, because the inland revenue changed the provision of uh, an asset and a vehicle this year. And I think in page... Um, page 66 through to 67, it actually talks in very general terms about the issues that we have given some consideration to. Things like officers providing their own cars. That's fraught with difficulty on insurance. Not many insurance companies provide blue light fire cover, so we would have to pay for that ourselves. Officers would not want cars to have blue lights fitted with them without any assurance that if they change them that all those things would be repaired to a satisfactory level because we have to provide 360 cover. We currently put in our own vehicles, dash cams, and we have a fleet monitoring system just being introduced now that was approved by authority to try to ensure that we get best efficiency and effectiveness out of the use of those vehicles. Providing, if people provide their own cars, we cannot insist that that will happen and therefore we can potentially re 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 we'll lose control. And as Chief, I think there are some issues around the health and safety of, of that recommendation. Quite happy to come, go away as, as described in here and come back to you with the actual detail that sits behind this report. The budget that was allocated in 2018 um, identified a provision which, which is contained in this report and it's contained in the recommendations going forward. So I certainly will work very hard to make sure you have that clarity before February where the determination on budget spend for next year is going to hopefully be signed off. And of course the other part of that, the leases for our current vehicles have to be um, terminated otherwise we incur significant costs we have to return the vehicles without blue lights in a fit state um, so repairs damage any curbing otherwise we pay a premium for those so there is a large turnover of time that we need to get cars out and to get people in it does have implications but I'm clearly directed we'll, we'll come back with some information in February good we need it we need, we need it even if we eventually agree with what you say we just certainly need to know it is very very sensitive uh, can you tell just remind me when will the special appliances review be completed being as you've mentioned the the alp the previous chief officer did the special services review last year and de and determined the the numbers so that had been completed um if it's not been reported um and i have to say sitting here now Following that question, I can't answer that with any clarity, with any certainty. I will certainly look back and make sure that the special services review is reported to a, a future meeting. As I said earlier on, if you can go and have a look at what other authorities do and see if we can learn from them rather than inventing the, reinvent, reinventing the wheel, that'll help you. And then if you look on C at the bottom, there is a provision here if there was an emergency vehicle required, myself and Kirk in consultation with the the treasurer can can approve it so we're not saying no we're just saying if you've got an emergency you'll have to ask us so i'll take question i'll, I'll formally move the recommendation so we've got something on the table and I'll second it. kirk will second and then we'll take any questions that you've got 
Okay, if, if we've no questions, we'll move straight to the vote then. So you've got the new recommendations on your paper. I've moved them, Kirk seconded them. Are we all happy? And we'll get something back in February. Okay, so that was agenda item. Was that 14 I've done? Okay, so I'm now, I'm now on 15. <laughs> sickness, and sickness, sickness and management proposals. So these are on 69 to 76. And again, it's you, Rick. Um, I'm hopeful that this report is detailed enough um, to give members assurance on what had previously been reported to CGC in terms of sickness data. Some of our sickness data last year was lost because of reporting difficulties that we had. And at the last CGC, that the, the figures weren't included. So on the back of that, that's why this paper is here. It gives you a benchmark between where we are and other relative authorities. And I think it's quite assuring that we perform relatively positively. And I think it's, it's credit to my officers and my support teams that we, we, we talk about the words presence, you know, not absentees, and we're looking at getting people back into the workplace. Um, you, you'll have seen from the previous also reports that we're doing lots of um, work around the support we give staff around mental health um, and other issues that are now becoming much more prolific for us in this complex world when we're asking people to do many, many more things than we were in the past. I'll take any questions. I've got Betty down. So can we think, uh, rather than note the report, can we welcome uh, the report? Because it is actually uh, quite good. And thank you, for, thank you for the work you've done. would be better than note, because if we've got something... Yes, so Betty... So we'll amend the word noted, Betty, to welcome and uh, whatever. OK, Betty. I, I just wanted <coughs> also to congratulate you on the work that's being done on um, mental health because that's a big issue. I, I see that you have a um, four-week series of mindfulness sessions and that they've been well attended. So I just wanted to ensure that we embed any work that's done on mental health within um, any policies that we have around sickness and health and to carry this through as much as we can. But what bothers me, and I think this is a thread that's run through most of the reports over the years that I've had, the reasons for sickness and support staff. I mean, can we do a little bit more in-depth analysis of why uh, there's so much, uh, uh, why we've got so many support staff with, with health issues? What else can be done? I think some of them, Betty, is just how they, in the past, they didn't used to categorise it, so now we have to categorise them, and sometimes people just pick, pick one. But Rick might be able to add something more to it. I think we could report in some more detail, and I think that, that, that I certainly will pick up to, for future CGC reports as to, to give you a bit more of a, a sort of a more detailed breakdown. In, in general terms, our, our support staff, there are much fewer of them than there were, Many of them, and certainly the HMI commented on the fact that even their own officers, they've seen three or four people, the same people, doing three or four different jobs, where in other services they see three or four different faces. Um, so, of course, the managing and the, the complications of that. The other part of it I would say to you is that absenteeism from the workplace puts additional burden on those people who are there, then left because teams are very small. Our business units are not, we're not carrying any surplus. So if someone's off and that the report says sometimes there are one or two people who can disproportionately impact on department absenteeism. Um, and of course that burden then falls to the rest of the people who are remaining at work and that just adds to the complication. So the issues that we're working on are about getting people back into the workplace for presence rather than absenteeism, but I'll, I'll note that port for the next time. Thank you very much. Because <coughs> mental health is, is an illness that people don't always see or recognise, and, and people are sometimes hide it. And, that, and, and I think it's an acknowledgement that there, there are people out there with mental health issues, and we need to do as much as possible to help them. It's a hidden illness quite often, and uh, what, whatever we can do as an authority to help our staff who have mental health illnesses would be good. Thank you. Okay, Ted, you're next. Thank you. First, I'm going to shout loud enough. First question is the, um, again, in terms of, we, we've got a chart on page 73 of, of the, the, the top five sickness reasons. Again, how does that compare to other 
blue light services in terms of um, what absenteeism uh, the reason for it is? That's the first question. The second one is just below that table, 4.111, the not yet known has been identified as a weakness in managing absence. Is a return to work form had not yet been completed to Cataraga's absence. But I mean, we, we, we know when the, the doctor's certificate expires, because they were, all would have had to have provided one of those. Um, appreciate, you know, that they could then say, well, I'll go back to the doctor and get another one. But And the, the, the last one is, is, could you just expand on what you said, um, Rick, earlier on, when you said that there was an issue with the, re the reporting, of collating your statistics? So there's three questions there. Thank you. OK, let's try and deal with them one at a time. The, the issues and breakdown, I can't tell you how we compare with other services. All I can c tell you is that the way that our reporting is done through the benchmarking used, using what's called the Cleveland data, they pull it all together, and it's represented in the way that you see it here. So where we perform as a service for absenteeism falls within that. So you know, we can do a lot of work on it. I'm not sure that it will tell us a great deal, but what we do know is the trend for uh, mental health issues and musculoskeletal are still the top two. It used to be predominantly musculoskeletal, certainly in fire sector for operational crews. Mental health is now starting to overtake it. So I can tell you that's pretty consistent. Uh, in terms of the, the, the return to work and the weaknesses in reporting, people do not on short-term sickness have to tell managers why they are off sick. They just tell them they're unwell. They don't have to tell you the reason why. They have to tell our occupational health team that, and the occupational health team will the, have a patient relationship confidentiality issue, and it falls under that general umbrella. It's really difficult, and it may, may feel uncomfortable, but people, if we push them too hard, will either make up the reason why they're off sick. If it falls, they might say it's mental health. It may not be, just to give you a tick in the box. They may say, I've got flu. Um, and we record it as flu. We j take the statement that they give us and we capture it as they give us. We don't challenge the reason why they're off sick. We just report on it. Um, so I don't know if that is helpful or other. The, the issue around categorisation, um, I'm sorry, I, I think I missed the point. Um, it would be useful if you could go back because there's been a lot to think about in the last few minutes. Yeah, no, when you, when you first introduced the report, you said something along the lines of... Um, there was an issue with um, the the collating system, um, which, which meant that you weren't able to provide yeah, some figures. Yeah, apologies. Yeah, it's come back to me. I had one of those goldfish moments. Um, the, the, the issue is that our, our recording system um, is tied into our operational mobilising system. So for a period of time in the summer, the system was down and we weren't we weren't confident of the data that was in the system. So what we had to do is we had to manually extract it and we had to get people to go through it manually to ensure that the data that has been recorded in the system was accurate. And that's what took the time. So we didn't want to report inaccurately when we knew there was a potential issue with the systems collation. That, those bugs and bug fixes, patches, or whatever you might want to call them, have been now resolved. So we're able to report now more frequently and hence why you've got the more detailed report in front of you today. One final, final question then, just of clarification then. So when you said about um, a, a firefighter, an officer, um, reporting that they, they were off sick, they only had to report to occupational health. Surely after a week, they don't have to provide a doctor's certificate with, with the reason stated that the doctor's written why they can't work. No, that's absolutely cr true, but we've short-term sickness and long-term sickness. Short-term sickness absence is reported to the line manager, and the line manager may only be told that the person is feeling unwell. The line manager can, depending on the relationship they have the employer, do a management referral to our occupational team, or the individual, if they're feeling the need, they can refer themselves to our occupational health team. That relationship stays private between the individuals and the occupational health unit, and they will write back to management with more general statements around how we can encourage, um, assist people back into the work environment. You're absolutely right. After a set amount of time, seven days, we require a note from the doctor and a f return to work fitness notes, not a certificate now, the, the, the wording has changed. So we do require that. Sometimes the wording on the doctor's notes are quite ambiguous as well.
we've got some recommendations. Oh, sorry, Bill. I mean, the, the only thing I'd say to you, uh, Rick, is if you're, if you're in trouble with some of your HR stuff, County Council's got a big HR department here. If you want help, I know you do your own and it's a bit specialist, but, <coughs> you know, between us and the city, you've probably got some of the best HR people in the, in the whole of the East Midlands. I would uh, look to them for some policies if you need, you need specialist help. Anyway, Bill. Yeah, uh, it, I might have missed it. I don't, my first meeting, so please forgive me. These figures do relate to all firefighters, including the, the part-time firefighters, or is it just the full-time staff? And are the figures broken down? Because if somebody's working elsewhere, their health may be affected by where they're working elsewhere other than the fire service. And we don't know that, according to this paper. Um, so I don't know where it refers to. Again, I think if you look at the, the, the tables on page 40, sorry, on page 70, this is an average of days lost per person, as it says there, so that's per person uh, across the whole time and control shifts, so that's referring to, so that's whole time firefighters and control operators. The table on 71 is just around, it doesn't include on call. Um, 71, the, the table below is for support staff. Um, and the breakdown for the others is the total number of shifts lost to long-term and short-term sickness, and that would be across um, the support team or whole time team. The difficulty, as you say, around on-call is exactly what you outlined, and that's why it's not reported in the way that, um, that would skew the figures, so it's not captured in this. One thing you could tell me, Rick, how many people have we got, have you, because you've got your own separate little HR department, how many people have you got in there? Um, we have an establishment, I think, is it f seven, is our HR team, but that's not all full-time equivalents. I'm just looking to Richard because I'm thinking it's seven. Well, that's quite off the top of my head, Rick, uh, but I can give you that information to share if you'd like. I I'm just thinking it, it, it is relatively small compared to HR departments here and in the city. I understand you've got someone coming from the city into your HR department who apparently is good. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, she's been there since the beginning of the year to assist us following the review that took place last year. I think in terms of we're not missing out on policies. I mean, our performance is really good. I think actually, um, even though the city and the county may be bigger than us and often we, we look to them in awe because of their sheer size, I think that there's some learning that could be done by them in coming to see what we do if you were to compare us with them. And I, if you want to, I could, I could do that on the next report, your choice. I don't particularly think we're asking for comparisons between the city and the county. I don't think it adds to the sum of knowledge. Just to, re to say to you, if you need help, don't be shy in asking for it with only six people. There it is small. So we've got the recommendations. I think I moved them. And did you second them? Oh, sorry. Yes, of course you can. I hadn't got you down. I only just put my hand up. Sorry. So it was just, um, I'm just remembering when I used to be employed by a local authority, they had a sickness policy where um, yeah, they counted not the number of days that you were off, but the number of times you were off, which I often thought was unfair because uh, say you'd been at work and then felt unwell and went home because you had migraine or whatever, um, you'd had perhaps several half days off at different times, it was counted as three separate incidents and you could be have to have the, the sickness interviews and explain why you had so much frequent absence, but people that were off for prolonged times, even if you never bothered turning up for weeks on end, and I say not, not bothered sounds a bit flippant, but if you were away for a long time, it was still only one absence, and so there wasn't the support for those people to come back to work. I wondered, do we have that three incidents rule, or is it based on how actual long someone's away or how ill they are? Um, it, we have a, a, a very detailed policy and, and sickness management arrangements that trigger after certain criteria and it's not just on a set number of dates. Of course, because we have such a range of duty systems, we have people whose absence may affect a 24-hour period and others who may affect a 12-hour period and others who might affect an, a 9-hour period if they work in a, an, an office environment. So we report on generally shifts lost. Um, and that again can be misleading because of course um, when we try to look at the cost of backfilling that certainly for 
operational firefighters, a loss of a person on a DCP station would cost us considerably more than replacement of a, a normal uh, two, two and four fire station or a DC station purely because the time period that it encounters, but our triggers are um, within our HR policy, they lead to three stages of review, which ultimately could lead to um, a severance of employment if the absenteeism isn't managed or the individuals are not receptive and cooperative in trying to get back to the workplace. Great, is the new lady from the city in charge of the, the HR department? Why don't we ask, being as members of genuine interest, when we've got a light agenda, why don't we get her here and uh, A, we can have a look at her and uh, B, she can answer some questions. And she, might, she, might like, she might like coming. If the February one's fairly hefty, don't put her on in February, but it, it might be useful to have her here, wouldn't it? Well, the February budget, uh, February is the dominant budget, so it probably is a little challenging, so yeah. we could do it for the future. If you we'll, have, we'll have her here, then we can ask detailed questions on things like that. I mean, obviously, she's an expert in anachronisms, DCP, DCC, two and four. I suppose she knows what gold book is and all that stuff as well, does she? Unfortunately, she has to. <laughs> okay, so recommendations, all happy with them? Yeah. Great. Let's move on then to, uh, are we on 16 now? Services delivery update, that's 77 to 82. And it says that it's you, Rick. Again, Chairman, I don't propose to go through each and every part of this. This is a regular item for members. It's been renamed, uh, I think appropriately, it was called an operational update, which made it focus on just the response phase of our engagement with the public. It's much more in tune with the way the organisation is structured and it covers the three areas of prevention, protection and response, giving uh, hope um, members some sense of what is happening on the ground over the periods. Um, some context around some of the more significant incidents and where, where, where there is need for improvement, some indication on what those improvements are, although that detail is fed through to CGC. Are we all happy with this, apart from replacing the word noted? So the CFA welcomes the contents of this report. Are we all happy with welcomes instead of note? Good, thank you. Uh, so we're now on to, uh, what are we on to now, 17? review and revision of the constitution of the combined fire authority uh, lauren's doing this lauren thank you chair um short and sweet from me you'll be pleased to hear members it's a, a sort of annual bit of governance and review of the constitution we've made some very slight changes which are shown on appendix one um to the contract procedure rules and in accordance with the constitution it's uh, the role of the cfa to approve those if you're happy to do so um they're not terribly significant you'll see some of them are just to bring them in uh, make them consistent with the finance procedure rules and um, to reflect changes in job titles and so on so I, I hope they're uncontroversial but they're a matter for you to approve um, authority. I'll move the recommendation because they're not controversial with me Second, all happy with them yeah. great okay so there's no urgent items uh, just to note that they will not note remind you that the next meeting will be held on the 6th of February and it's at fire headquarters. Um, if we can remember to turn up half an hour early so you get a chance to speak to your spokesman, Ted. Uh, so the next one is the exclusion of press and public. I move under section 100A of the Local Government Act 72, the public be excluded for the following item of business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraphs 4, 5 and 10 of part 1 of Schedule 12A of the Act, um, and that in all circumstances of the case, the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. I move. Second, All happy to go to confidential? Yeah. 